thank you so much for taking some time to allow me to visit with you for a little while as we open the Bible and look at some scripture found in the book of Acts chapter 2. If uh, your Bible is handy, would you turn with me as we look at scripture today found in Acts chapter 2. If you're securing your Bible and turning to that place, let me just mention a couple things to you. Uh, first of all, the Administrative Council met this past week, and because of a number of matters at hand, uh, the Administrative Council determined that uh, we would target the second Sunday of July to get us back into our sanctuary. Now, we've given consideration and looked at the possibility of what it would be like for us to have proper social distancing in terms of seating in our sanctuary, and uh, we determined that because of the limited space that we have and uh, the accommodation of just a limited number of people, it would be better for us to wait until the end of phase two that has been ordered by our governor uh, in North Carolina, Governor Cooper, to uh, review this at the end of phase two, which would be the 26th of the month of June. Now, the Administrative Council will be meeting together at the church on the 24th of this month, and uh, we will be determining exactly what we need to do in terms of seating. There is a possibility that we might move into the fellowship hall for a short period of time uh, to accommodate the number of people that will be worshiping with us in person on campus. I do want to say that uh, we are making every effort, and we will certainly be in compliance with all of uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention measures uh, to make certain that our building is uh, clear and free of any trace of COVID, and uh, we'll have information for you uh, that will be forthcoming. I want to thank you again for your patience. Uh, I don't know that any congregation could have been as patient and understanding as you have been. And I also want to thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. Uh, I don't talk a whole lot about giving uh, because there are some who believe that that's what preachers primarily talk about. But uh, I want to say to you, thank you. Uh, your faithfulness and your financial stewardship to the kingdom of God has been exemplary. And uh, it is certainly deeply appreciated. Uh, every obligation that the church continues to have uh, is satisfied in full on a regular, timely basis. And we appreciate so very much your faithfulness. Now, I'm going to uh, begin this, well, I'm going to conclude today a message that I started last Sunday, again, which was Pentecost Sunday. And we're looking at the profile of a Pentecostal church. Now, remember that every Pentecostal is an evangelical. That means that uh, evangelicalism is simply a movement that goes back to the Great Reformation in which there is a, a common conviction and belief in the authority and the trustworthiness of Scripture, the uh, virgin birth of Christ, his sinless life, his death on the cross of Calvary, his resurrection on the third day, his ascension back to the Father with the responsibility left upon the church to evangelize lost people, to help people to know Jesus, to come to Christ through the wonderful, life-saving, life-transforming gospel of Jesus, and that Jesus Christ is going to come again. And while all Pentecostals are evangelical, we understand that all evangelicals are not Pentecostal. We're looking at a Pentecostal church because the Crossway Church is a Pentecostal church, and we're trying to give consideration from a scriptural standpoint of just what the profile of a Pentecostal church would be. And we're basing this on the New Testament book of Acts, and we're looking at what the Bible says about the Pentecostal church in the first century, because we believe that their story is our story, and we believe that what is demonstrated in the book of Acts 
ought to be demonstrated through the church of the 21st century. Now, I want to read, uh, to put the scriptures in context, in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading with verse 42 and read down through verse 47. And again, as my custom is, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Luke, who wrote this, writes the following. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as any one had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And I pray that God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts and that the Spirit of the Lord might speak through this preacher uh, to your heart today in the name of Jesus. Now, we gave consideration last time we were together uh, to the fact that the Pentecostal church, then as it should be today, was a powerful church. And that's based upon the fact that Jesus promised in Acts 1.8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now that realization took place on the day of Pentecost. And so what we're looking at is the after effect of the Pentecostal blessing being the uh, reality in that New Testament church, as is recorded in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And we noticed in uh, our last time together, not only the power of a Pentecostal church, but also the priority of the Pentecostal church, the priorities, and they were persistent. Because in Acts 42, Luke says that they continued steadfastly. That means to give strong attention to. And uh, he notices these, or he enumerates the things that they were giving authority or consideration to on a regular basis. Uh, The Apostles' Doctrine, which refers to teaching the truth. And uh, the teaching of the truth came from what Jesus had taught them. And so there is no contradiction in what Jesus taught them and what we find uh, elaborated upon in the remaining books of the New Testament. Then we also gave consideration to the fact that they were together. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. Thirdly, they continued steadfastly at the table. Uh, This is a reference to communion, which is an ordinance of the church. And nearly every church practices communion uh, on a regular basis because it does express the Lord's death until he comes. And then finally, we notice that they were continued steadfastly in prayer. And uh, as I mentioned to you in our last uh, being time to being together, that uh, the word of prayer or its derivative is found no less and 32 times in the book of Acts. Now, we continue with this thought, not only looking at the power of a Pentecostal church, uh, the priorities in which they were persistent in in a Pentecostal church, but I want us to think about the personality of a Pentecostal church. Now, when I speak about the personality, I'm speaking about the life of the church the way the church does ministry. You know, every church, regardless of the church you attend on a regular basis or any denominational or independent church, will have its own personality. It will be unique. It will have its own philosophy of ministry. How is the philosophy 
of ministry conducted? How is the church doing ministry? What is the primary makeup of the personality of the church? And that's true of all churches. Uh, one of the things that we know about the church, especially in America, is that there is no cookie cutting of the church. Uh, every church is unique. You can go into any Pentecostal church and you will find that there will be some differences as to how ministry is conducted, how worship services take place, and that would be true of any evangelical church. And I know that if you're a regular church attender and have worshiped in different churches, uh, whether you've been looking for a church or you've been on vacation and attended a church or just visited with a friend or family member in their church, you find that to be true. But I want us to think about this church, the Pentecostal church, as it's presented to us in the book of Acts. And again, I think their story should be our story. First of all, I notice the disposition of this church. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, the first part of that verse, then fear came upon every soul. Now, this word fear is really better translated awe. In fact, the New Living Translation translates this statement, there was a deep sense of awe. And I like that translation. I think that it does certainly hit at what Luke is attempting to convey. What he is saying here is that when this church was together, there was a deep sense of reverence. There was an understanding that as the church, they were a supernatural living organism in a natural world. And this is important to us because when we gather together as a church, there ought to be a sense of wonder. The church is the most unique living organism on the face of this earth. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, the church is what Jesus died for, and the church is what Jesus is going to return for. And the church is those uh, individuals who have been purchased through the precious blood of Jesus. They have confessed their sins, they have repented of their sins. They have the witness of the Holy Spirit of God in them that they are children of God. And their lifestyles are compatible with what the Bible teaches us as to what is expected by God for the way that we live and conduct ourselves on a regular basis. And so it's not about a denomination. It's about believers in the Lord the body of Christ. And so the personality of this church is expressed in its disposition. But then, interestingly enough, he makes reference to the demonstration that was taking place in the church and outside of the church. He says in verse 43, the second part of that verse, that many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, there are some in our evangelical community who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're fellow believers. Uh, they do not believe that wonders and signs are possible for today. Uh, they believe that it's something that uh, was unique to the first century church. And when the last of the apostles, which would have been uh, the Apostle John, who died around 99 AD, that that's when all of the signs and the wonders ceased to be demonstrated, that, uh, that there's no need to look for or expect that to take place. Well, as Pentecostal believers, we don't buy into that. We believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus is not constrained or limited in any way by any time period in the history of the church. Now, we don't see a lot of wonders and signs taking place, especially in America, uh, because the primary reason for wonders and signs to take place was for the confirmation of the gospel. And uh, in most cases, in the church, 
people who are attending church have already by faith believed and received the truth that Jesus is capable of doing anything. The Bible makes it very clear that with God, all things are possible. Jesus is still saving people today. People are still being healed today. Uh, people are still having miraculous reconciliations taking place today. Uh, people are being able to see the hand of God move and be demonstrated in a way uh, to work miracles on their behalf. Now, we don't promote the demonstration of wonders and signs because Jesus said to, John, uh, to Thomas in John's gospel, in John chapter 20, blessed are those who have not seen yet still believe. Now, the fact of the matter is that we don't see them much. Uh, in fact, I'm talking about these miraculous demonstrations in a worship service. And sometimes you might be like Gideon was in Judges chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, Gideon asks the question, where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about? Well, we are living miracles. And <laughs> interestingly enough, when Gideon asks that question, it's uh, in the very presence of the Lord who appears to him while he's in the threshing floor. That was a miracle in and of itself. And what Gideon failed to realize is that a miracle was happening, but he didn't recognize it. He didn't see it as a miracle. We have reports on a regular basis among missionaries who, who served uh, in areas of the world where the gospel is first being presented of miracles that do take place. Now, Jesus made it really clear to us in um, Mark's gospel, chapter 14, that these signs will follow them that believe. Now, be careful here to understand the priority. Jesus said that the believers do not follow the signs and the wonders, but the wonders and the signs will follow after those who believe. If a person is dependent upon a regular demonstration of the miraculous to take place, or if they fail to recognize the miraculous that is happening around them, then that's going to make for a rather shallow spiritual Christian experience. We thank God for every demonstration of his marvelous miracle working power in our midst, but we're not looking for that first. Those things take place as a consequence of the confirming of the gospel message and also as a blessing of the merciful, gracious God that we serve. And so Luke continues as he's talking about the personality or the life of the church. And he has something to say here about distribution. Now, this is very important. Look in verses 44 and 45 again. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And that's very important to understand. There was a need. The need was met. Now, on a surface reading of this verse, uh, some might believe that the church should be all about social gospel, that uh, the people were living almost like in a social utopia uh, of communal living. And that is not the case. As a matter of fact, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, makes it clear that if a man is not willing to work, neither should he eat. Now, obviously, he's talking about a man who's capable of working, who's physically able to work, but uh, if he's going to eat, then he's got to work. And obviously, I think that we need to be careful to understand when you look at the apostles, uh, particularly the apostle Paul, uh, he certainly was one who embraced this whole concept of capitalism because he was a tent-making preacher. Uh, he worked to supplement for his uh, physical 
and earthly needs by working an honest living, to earn an honest living. And that certainly would be the case in this New Testament church. Now, the reason that the church was uh, practicing this was because of the rapid growth of the church. And uh, there were people who worked for individuals who were very much committed to Judaism. That's uh, the system of worship that uh, had been instituted, instituted by Moses uh, in the Old Testament era. And many times when a person became a believer, they became a Christian, and if they worked for someone who was a Judaizer and committed to Judaism, they oftentimes could lose their job because of a uh, soft persecution, if you please. And so in order to encourage the church and to take care of the church, the church willingly did this. This was something that was uh, done out of love. Now, the three things that we need to understand about this is that it was always out of necessity if someone had a need. And I think it's also important to point out that the need that was attempted to be met was met by the believers, plural, and it was met uh, to meet the need, or it was attempted to meet a need of a fellow believer. Now, that's not to say that we don't help others, because we do. Our local church, from time to time, uh, gives assistance to people, and we don't ask them if they are Christians first, because we believe that love and uh, to do what Jesus would have us to do motivates us to give assistance to a person in their dire need. Now, obviously, we want to take care of the needs of the people uh, that are in our fellowship, and we're not constrained to do this. It was voluntary. Uh, the apostles made no demand. Uh, there was no ordinance set up in the church uh, of a law that said that the church had to do this, but it was done because it was motivated by love. When you read uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, you find that Jesus makes it clear that love will meet the need of an individual with, without giving consideration uh, to their ethnicity, their skin color, or their belief system. Love will always act in a way that is representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I hope that that might be helpful to some who would uh, advocate that the church should, first of all, be primarily about meeting social needs in the world. Obviously, there's not enough money in the world to meet all of the social needs of the world, but we concentrate on those areas where we can have immediate beneficial and helpful influence to those who have need. Then I want you to notice the demeanor of this church. It's, this is so interesting to me because in verse 46, Luke says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. What does it say to us? Well, I think Luke is saying that the profile of that first church, which should be the profile of this church, is that there was an attitude of spontaneity and sincerity when it came to praising the Lord and to magnify the Lord and in just being together. We look forward to the day we can be back in our sanctuary as we were prior to COVID-19. That's going to be a time of great rejoicing. But at the same time, we need to understand that it's not just simply rejoicing in the fact that we can have togetherness in our spiritual and social interactions. It's also important to note that there was a genuine spirit of praise and thanksgiving that characterized this church. 
Earlier today, I was reading about uh, Simeon in Luke chapter 2, who was able to go into the temple and there at the dedication of Jesus by Joseph and Mary in the temple service, uh, Simeon was able to make some prophetic statements. But what impressed me about Simeon is that he was moved to go into the temple by the Spirit, capital S, so the Holy Spirit. And the thought occurred to me as I read that this morning is that the way we enter into a worship service will have a great deal to do with what we see in a worship service. And what we see and experience in the worship service, as is motivated by the Holy Spirit, will have a great deal to do with how we leave a worship service. And so this church in its demeanor had a great uh, impression upon not only those who were in attendance. You can imagine if someone uh, were thinking about becoming a believer or they were on a journey that would lead them ultimately to accept Christ as their Savior or those who were outside of the fellowship. There was encouragement within but there was also influence without. Uh, people were taking note of these people that they had been with Jesus and that there was something uniquely different and wonderful about their worship. The final thing that I want to say about the profile of a Pentecostal church is this, and that has to do with the productiveness of that church. Notice the last part of the statement that uh, Luke makes in verse 47. He says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I think that's such a, a, a marvelous expression and certainly an attention-getting expression. So what is he saying? He's saying that the church of that day was rapidly growing numerically. There was something going on, and it was the Spirit of God working in and through those believers that caused the church to have significant numerical growth. Now, obviously, there are some who would be critical of any preacher that says anything about numbers. You know, there is a book in the Bible that's called Numbers, and uh, the emphasis is never on numerical growth. In fact, when you read the uh, New Testament, you see that the emphasis is always on the spiritual health of a church as opposed to the numerical growth of the church. But one will follow the other. If there is spiritual health in the church, then there will be numerical growth in the church. And this is evident in the book of Acts. I mean, when you look at what takes place in the book of Acts, you cannot help but be uh, struck with the fact that this was a church that was a growing church. It was not a dead church. It was a church that was very, very much alive. And remember that the whole concept of Pentecost, it was a feast. It was called the Feast of Pentecost. Most oftentimes, it was referred to sometimes as the Feast of Weeks, but it was also known as the Feast of Harvest. And when we think about harvest, we think about bringing in uh, a harvest. And in this case, it refer refers to a harvest of souls. Now think about this. In Acts chapter 1, verse 15, we read that there were 120 believers that had assembled together in that upper room. After Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, you see that there were 3,000 people saved. Now, in the Bible, oftentimes you have a counting of the men and uh, not taking into consideration the counting of women and children. Um, that was part of the culture of the church at that time. And uh, obviously, the number uh, of people that were saved is the point here. There's no gender reference to that 3,000, but there were 3,000 saved in a day. And then when you come to Acts 2.47, we find that uh, the 
every single day. It would have been a curious thing in that day if someone had not confessed sins, accepted the gospel, and become part of the body of Christ. Then when you come to Acts 4.32, we find Luke now talking about multitudes of people that believe. In Acts chapter 5, verse 14, he says that multitudes were being added to the church. In Acts 6, 1, he says that the believers were multiplied. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, he says that the believers were greatly multiplied. When you come to Acts chapter 8, when Philip went to Samaria and preached, the whole city and the community was baptized in a state of great joy. And so the point here is that the New Testament church, following the plan of Jesus as he outlined it in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, in the power of his spirit, was a church that was growing. Now, they, don't, they didn't have worship services every single day. What they did have was a body of believers who had been genuinely and gloriously saved. And it was through their testimony and through their influence that they were reaching their family and their friends to come to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. The thing that I want to say in closing is this. Their story should be our story. And if we are a truly Pentecostal church, we're not going to be a church that's given to fanaticism. We're not going to be a church that's being held by the chain of legalism. We're not going to be a church that's going to be shallow and spotty. We'll be a consistent group of believers. And my prayer is that uh, we will have far more than just a sentimental attachment. Uh, to Pentecostalism, but we will be a church that not only knows our history and knows who we are, but we practice what we believe. We want a generation that follows us to continue in the pathway that was established for us in the book of Acts as a New Testament dynamic Pentecostal church. There was a, an evangelist who uh, traveled from place to place to preach, and one uh, revival that he was uh, conducting, it was uh, relatively close to his home. And so uh, he took his young son with him. The boy was not very old. And uh, as they were driving to the church, uh, the boy asked his daddy again, what church are we going to, daddy, tonight? Where are you preaching? And he told him, he told him that it was a Pentecostal church. And the little boy said, Daddy, what is a Pentecostal church? And the father responded to his son, and he said, Well, son, it's a church where there's great joy and enthusiasm for the Lord. It's a church where there is a real spirit of conviction, where the climate of the church is uh, open for people to come to Christ and accept Christ. And it is a church where the Bible is preached and people pray and they love each other. And the little boy thought for a moment and then he asked his daddy. He said, Daddy, have I ever seen a Pentecostal church? Think about that. I don't want a generation that follows me to be a generation who does not know what a Pentecostal church is. I want the generation that follows me to understand what a Pentecostal church is and what Pentecostal belief is all about. And I pray that is also a burden shared by you. Pray with me, if you will. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Spirit of God who inspired it, because that Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. We thank you for the great history of our church, and we thank you, Lord, for the demonstration of what you worked and did in that church in the first century. I pray that that will be continued and regularly seen and evidenced in our church today. 
Bless, I pray, all who hear. And I pray, Lord, that if there are those who have been watching our presentations and enjoying the worship that we provide, I pray that they would feel comfortable in visiting with us and find that we are a church who genuinely loves the Lord and we love other people. Bless, I pray, the people that are hearing and keep your hand upon them. Give them favor. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for allowing us to visit with you again in this fashion. And remember, we will continue on this uh, train and uh, hope that we will get into the depot and uh, the caboose will uh, arrive safely on the second Sunday of July. Continue to remember to pray for one another, contact one another, and uh, feel free to get in contact with me if there is a need. And you can rest assured we'll do whatever we can to help meet that need. God bless you. We love you in Jesus' name. Until next time.